May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Good morning. morning. It's so wonderful to see all of you this morning on this, my last Sunday here. Friday night was also a wonderful, wonderful occasion. I thank everyone who worked so hard to... Uh, and all the people that came and all the love that was spread that night, the fellowship committee, the staff, and especially Father Jim, uh, it was truly, I really truly felt loved. Uh, I am so thrilled today to see all these acolytes uh, here serving this morning. A couple of weeks ago when we were serving, I said, uh, I grew up with most of y'all, so uh, you know, I hope you'll serve on my last Sunday and I want you to see how many there are here and, and rejoicing and celebrating with me. Uh, anyway, let's get back to the gospel. Uh, on this third Sunday in Advent, we see John the Baptist in a little different uh, than we did last week. Uh, he's not the John that was crying in the wilderness and then announcing that the kingdom of heaven was, at, at, uh, was coming. He's now in prison. He's been criticizing the King Herod for messing around with his sister-in-law a little bit too intimately. And so they put him in prison. And as he sits in prison, word gets through to him about what the things that Jesus is doing in his ministry. And it troubles him. Even to the point that John begins to have a little doubt about, is Jesus the Messiah, the one I've been proclaiming? But John expected Jesus to be a different person. He expected him to be a man of fire, just like Elijah was, who destroyed the prophets of Baal in the Old Testament. One who would come and bring vengeance upon that occupying uh, forces of Rome. And he looked forward to the day when Jesus would confront Herod and knock him off his throne and establish a great kingdom of peace and prosperity for the nations of Israel. However, it seemed as though Jesus wasn't doing just, was doing just the opposite. He, wasn't teach, he was teaching love and forgiveness of everyone, even their enemies, making friends with tax collectors and Samaritans, prostitutes, lepers, and other sinners, people who the Jews regarded as outsiders. Jesus was gaining a great reputation, but not for doing what John thought he should be doing. John is now sitting in prison alone, doubting who Jesus really was. So he sends his disciples to ask Jesus his famous question. Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answers, go tell in John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. Now, I love that Jesus showed us who he was by naming all these miracles, miracles that we so often overlook today as miracles. But if you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, and if you believe Jesus always satisfies our most inward and deepest need, Sometimes through miracles from a direct uh, contact with him, or encounter with him, or sometimes through people like yourselves, other people he uses to bring about his miracles. Then the question is, do you recognize and proclaim Jesus as your Messiah in all the many situations and circumstances of your life? And I mean every day, not just on Sundays. I want you to think about that question as I share some of my personal experiences that have helped me to know without a doubt that Jesus is the Messiah, my personal Savior, your personal Savior. Things that I've heard and seen as Jesus tells the, the uh, disciples of uh, John the Baptist to tell the people. So I've been blessed by God for many, many uh, experiences with the risen Jesus that you don't have time this morning to hear. If I told you every experience, supernatural experience that I've had in the last 34 years, we'd be here late in the evening this afternoon. 
But first, let me say, I can never recall a time when I was not a part of the church. I attended church and Sunday school and youth group every Sunday as a child. However, my first true memory that I knew Jesus was who he said he was, the Messiah, our Savior, that he had died for my sins and was resurrected from the dead, he was alive and present with me every day, was when I was 13 years old. I had a Sunday school teacher named Mr. Taylor, and one of the Sundays he came in the class and said that he wanted to share a story about his six-year-old son who had been sick for some time, and we knew that, but he said his son was dying, which we didn't know, and that he had been sitting with his side, by his side every minute for the last several weeks while he was in a coma. He told us that a couple of days before Sunday that he was sitting there holding his hand, praying with him, for him. He said all of a sudden his son opened his eyes. He woke up. He looked at his dad in the eyes and said, Daddy, I've been with Jesus, and it was wonderful. You don't have to worry about me anymore. Everything's going to be good. At 13, I learned to believe in the resurrection of Jesus, and it was from a six-year-old. And since then, I've experienced the risen Jesus many, many times in many different ways, in my life. Another very meaningful and memorable time after my mother died, had pa my mother had passed away, was another very uh, supernatural experience of, with myself, with Jesus. It was the first Sunday after I'd returned back from the funeral, and I went to communion the rail as I put my hands out to receive the body of Jesus. I felt my mother's hand in my hand, giving me the bread. It was so real, I remember being shocked and opening my eyes and looking up to see what was going on. And I just saw Father McMichael uh, giving me the bread, my priest. But the next Sunday, the same thing happened again. And the next Sunday, too. So I made an appointment with Father Michael to share this experience that I did not understand. He explained, as Timothy writes in his first letter, there is only one mediator between God and mankind, and that is Jesus Christ. He said that the only way I could ever experience my risen mother's presence is through the risen Jesus. He is the way, the life, and the truth, the mediator between heaven and earth. He descended from heaven, and at his ascension, he ascended back into heaven, and he has got this mediator between heaven and earth that gives us that uh, connection with the loved ones in heaven. But, Father Michael said, you can't leave Jesus out. It's the only way that you can experience the true presence of your mother is through Jesus, the mediator between heaven and earth. And since that time, I have had many, many experiences of the presence of my mother. And yes, I still talk to her all the time. I can say thank you, Jesus, because now when it happens, I don't exclude Jesus in the, the contact. And it's interesting, just a side note, as people, two people were leaving church at 8 o'clock this morning, they said they would like to share an experience they had with a loved one uh, sometime. And I said, I definitely want to hear it. I have also known many parishioners who have shared with me in the past that they've experienced the living presence of a loved one, and many of them actually saw that loved one. Two of them are from this church. I have experienced one who lost their son 30 years old in a motorcycle accident, and she was telling me she was cooking breakfast and she saw him sitting at the table where he sat every morning. There was another one that had seen their loved one while they were working in the yard. This is possible through the, the presence of Jesus as being the mediator between heaven and, and earth. So this could only happen if Jesus is the Messiah. It could only happen if our Savior, has, as our Savior prophesied by John the Baptist. These and many more encounters with Jesus 
were before I ever became a priest. But then when I became a priest, I have, have had several people in the last couple of weeks saying, in your story when I said I was going to share personal experiences, they wanted to hear about my calling, about why I am a priest, which is another supernatural experience. But at first I have to share that I became an Episcopalian through my wife, Anne. Uh, and when I went to the church with her for the first time, I said, wow, I've been an Episcopalian all my life. I just didn't know it. <laughs> well, little did either of us know what God had in mind for us. I was a very happy engineer and had ambitions of moving up the ladder of success. But God had other plans for me and Anne as he does for all of you. In 1974, Ann and I made our Crucio in the Diocese of Louisiana. Now that's a three-day spiritual retreat at the diocesan camp. And I'm sure you've heard of that, and if you haven't gone, I encourage you uh, to look into it if possible. Two things I'll share with you that happened to me that weekend. First, we went to chapel many times during the weekend. But one of the particular time, I think it was in the evening before bedtime, I again had an experience with Jesus at communion. As I knelt at the rail waiting for the priest to put the communion bread in my hand, I felt an overwhelming presence of Jesus that I don't always have at communion, but I do many, many times. I can't remember exactly what was going on at that time, but I can describe it as a powerful presence of Jesus at the altar rail. All I remember is Jesus telling me that all my sins of the past are forgiven. And what really touched me is I've had some pretty horrible, terrible experiences in the past, tragically, and I, I was told that I need to forget those. I need to give those to God. And you know, I did. Now that doesn't mean I can't remember them, but I don't have the hurt and pain when I, when I do. I just give it to God. And at that moment, that bread was placed in my hand. I had the same feeling that I had when I was baptized at 10 years old. I could feel like a new person. And I was a new person. The second thing that I learned at Curcio is not quite so uh, life-shaking, but it led to my, uh, my calling. I had never heard of morning prayer. Morning offerings is a call. Praying for God the first thing in the morning. Using a prayer card with psalms and prayers on it. I never prayed in the morning. I was too busy. I alarm went off. I jumped up and got in the shower, dressed, went to work, and I never thought about praying anymore during the day. Some of you might can relate to that. However, I began to pray my morning offering card in the shower with hot water running on my back. I may be in there 30 minutes or an hour. Well, in 1982, this is 1974 to 82, one morning, no different than any morning, I heard a soft voice that said, I want you to be my priest. Well, I thought, where did that come from? Then another month, it was a month later before I heard it again. I want you to be my priest. And then again in maybe two weeks, in one week, and it was over and over until it got where it was every morning I was hearing Jesus say, I want you to be my priest. Well, it started with something that I thought was maybe just a thought. But by this time, I knew that I was being uh, talked to with Jesus asking me to be his priest. Well, this continued for like two, two and a half years. And during that time, I uh, said, sorry, God, I believe in you, I worship you, I serve you, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> you see, the more I heard this, the more I got involved in outreach at St. Matthias, telling Jesus, look, see all these good things that I'm doing and all these outreach ministries? I don't need to be a priest. I argued I was too old to go back to school. I argued that I had three children, that I couldn't put them through that as a change in their life. even telling Jesus I worked to be an engineer very hard and I was determined to move up the ladder of success 
This went on, as I said, for two, two and a half years every morning. I had many excuses. I got depressed. I got angry. I got frustrated. But then when I would leave, it would be the normal day. One time at the end, I said, okay, Jesus, if you really, truly want me to do this, I want a burning bush like Moses. <laughs> but guess what? I didn't get it. <laughs> I went to church one Sunday morning, came back from communion, knelt down to pray, and this is the first time that I'd ever heard this voice outside the shower which I thought was strange that I was hearing this. But, kneeling there, hearing, uh, I want you to be a priest, I said, I told you I would do that if you gave me a burning bush. And I did not get one. So I kept giving excuses. I ran through this whole smear of, of excuses very quickly. I'd been doing it, that I was not going to become a priest. I was not going to seminary. I could not do that. And then, the voice came, don't you trust me? Different than I want you to be a priest. Don't you trust me? I was dumbfounded. I couldn't think of anything to say. But I knew that I either had to say, yes, okay, I trust you enough to be your priest or to get out of the church forever. And I knew that I couldn't do that. I'd been in the church since I was born. So I asked one more time, Lord, give me that burning bush so I know that I'm doing the right thing. Again, I did not get a burning bush. So I said, okay, I trust you, Lord, and I'll do it anyway. I've been, I, I'm tired of this for two years. I can't take any more of it. <laughs> At that moment, I said, yes, I got my burning bush. <laughs> I thought I was on fire. My whole body felt like it was burning from head to feet. I think probably just a few seconds, but it was uh, very obvious that God had approved of what uh, my answer and say yes. And the rest is history. Yesterday, I celebrated 34th anniversary of my ordination to the priesthood. Thank you. I haven't regretted a minute of it. <clears throat> One more thing. I had not said anything to Ann or to the children or anybody in the office because I knew I was going to win out. Well, when I went home after church that Sunday for the first time, I told Ann the story and uh, uh, that I had an appointment with Father Michael the next morning to talk about it. Her answer was, thanks, God, it's over. <laughs> she had known all along that something was going on, so much that uh, she heard me arguing with God in the shower. It was a verbal, out loud thing. <laughs> and she went to our associate priest uh, to talk to him as what she should do. And his answer was, do nothing. Uh, just let that between God and let Leo and God figure that out. So two years or so later, I'm sure she was relieved. Uh, and I've had so many supernatural experiences in my ministry, miracles in my ministry, that there's no doubt in my mind or my soul that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, my Savior, your Savior. And I'll share one more story. And I'll share it because it's a story... Uh, that I've heard from many, it's a story of healing. And uh, I think that Jesus is a healer and that we have miracles in healing all the time. And why some aren't, I don't know. That's uh, God's business. But I know he gives us healings, miracle healings, uh, to help us have hope, to help us know that it might happen to us. Uh, but anyway, I got a call from the secretary at the church that a parishioner was going to the hospital uh, to have surgery that I didn't know about. So I immediately went there. I found he and his wife already down in the holding room. And uh, just as I got there, the doctor came in. 
So he told them that uh, uh, this was an exploratory surgery and uh, it didn't, all the scans and tests had shown that uh, his cancer was spread throughout his body and he wasn't really sure why they were doing the surgery. Uh, but maybe there was something he could do to prolong his life or make it a little bit easier. When the doctor left, I remember looking at, at uh, them and both of them, tears were just pouring down their eyes. So I told them with emotion, he's a doctor. <laughs> he doesn't know everything. Don't listen to him. The real physician is God. And he is the one that will heal you of anything. So we're going to pray and ask God's blessings on you and heal you and to cast out and rebuke this cancer. Well, we did. He went into surgery. Hours later, when the doctor came back from surgery, he told his wife, me, that there was no cancer. He said the machines must have made a mistake. Well, we knew it was God who had healed him miraculously. And a side story to that is I use that story in a sermon, and maybe you might have remembered it. I used it in a sermon a year ago, maybe. And when I was on the porch, as I was greeting people, uh, this gentleman came out. And I said, what are you doing here? Because he goes to another church. He said, I don't know. I just got up this morning and thought I'd come and see you. He said, you were talking about me, weren't you? <laughs> I said, I sure was. So God gave him <coughs> a blessing that day, too. I believe in miracles. And I have witnessed other healings like this one. These miracles are moments in my life when I recognize Jesus is the one that has come and that know that the kingdom of heaven is near. I've brushed against it and it has changed me. These are the moments when we all share in the life and the work of the Messiah. To participate in the kingdom of heaven to take our place as members of the body of Christ and proclaim, yes, Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ of my life. And I know without a doubt, I don't have to be like John the Baptist. I know without a doubt, there is no need to look for another. Amen.